bless your word right now, God. And Lord, it could be 50 years, it could be 50 minutes. We don't know, Lord, but we want to be watching. Thank you, God, that we can gather here. We can sing your praises, Lord, in one one Lord, sometime we might just open our eyes and be right there, God, just like Enoch who walked with you, and then he just was not. And Lord, that would be just fine with me. And Lord, until that time, may we be a light in this world, Lord, that is so desperate for witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just look to you, God, for everything and ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us from your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 16, verse 1, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and who, those who worshipped his image. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water. They became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is, who was, and is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they didn't repent and give him glory. So how sad that is. You know, there is etched into a building in Washington, D.C. You can find these there, you know, I haven't been there, but I read about them. There's a, a rhetorical question etched in this building that says, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure if they remove the only firm foundation of those liberties, which is the convictions that liberties are the gift of God? And those convictions cannot be violated without experiencing his wrath. The rhetorical question, I tremble, the writer says, when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. What we're seeing here now at verse 16 is the second half of the tribulation period, the final act of God's just judgment coming to pass. It's going to come upon this earth during the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, just prior to the Lord's return. God's mercy that I've been pointing out is shown in that his judgment comes in an ever-increasing way all the way along. That's what's amazing to watch in these last days we're living in. You know, dude, if I wasn't saved, I'd have no clue that the Pope's visit to Babylon was, you know, had any significance. I really wouldn't even know what Babylon is, to tell you the truth. I wouldn't know that Israel's problems were something that God was using to awaken the nations of the earth, but not just the nation, but the Jews themselves are waking up. And I probably wouldn't care. But see, as a Christian, as I watch these things, you know, I'm in a state of great anticipation. My Lord's return for his church, you know, more than ever. I mean, you think, how much further will he allow evil to accelerate before the rapture? You know, I don't know. But his word tells me that the present trials and tribulations are for the refining and purifying of his bride. The present, Jesus told his disciples, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Right now, he's purifying his bride. Once the church is removed, then great tribulation is going to come upon the entire world in preparation for the unsaved world's final judgment. And even in that, God is very gracious. Over the, as we've been studying here, he allows a gradual increase even then in an effort to save anyone. But there is going to come a finality to his judgment of the earth, and that's what we're seeing right here. The way this final judgment on the earth was introduced, we saw back in chapter 15, was like John saw a vision that took place. If you look at chapter 15, verse 2, 
he says, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass having harps of God. As I said last time, these mentioned here represent the final souls of redeemed humanity from the earth. The last of what are called the tribulation saints. All the imagery, as we saw in chapter 15, is taken from the book of Exodus, where Israel was redeemed out of Egypt through the Red Sea parting, a pillar of fire, and they sang the song of Moses in Exodus 15, as it says these did do here in verse 3. But the Exodus generation sang the song of Moses while the Egyptians were being buried behind them as God judged that nation. And so here, it's like they're standing in preparation of this final judgment. All who could be saved have been saved. And then in verse 5 of chapter 15, John says, After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen, having their chests girded with gold bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So there's this procession, like a ceremonial event, as these seven angels come marching forth from the throne of God. And they receive these bowls of judgment, which represent God's wrath to be poured out. So it's as if, as you see this scene here, it's as if we're shown this transference of the intangible wrath of God that is the result of his perfect justice it's being transferred into physical judgment through this interaction that takes place there in chapter 15. Divine justice is an intang it's a intangible attribute. You can't see it. But God is just, and he is perfectly just. But here, that which is intangible is being represented as being transformed into tangible judgment. See, obviously God doesn't take judgment lightly. It's represented a very solemn event. Man, this is the end that's going to come. You can imagine this creation that God, you know, has been redeeming humanity out of. Here comes the end of that. God's wrath is an act of his will that conforms to perfect justice. Human beings, you know, and human beings' wrath is an emotion that results from selfish motives. All you got to do is hang around a two or three year old for five minutes usually. If they don't get their way, wrath builds up in them. Man, they throw their toy, they hit their brother or sister, they throw their temper tantrum. You know, as people mature, Lord willing, they learn to suppress that desire to throw my toys and hit somebody, even though people still get in fights. But as you look at God's wrath poured out in chapter 16 now, that is exercised through the agency of angels. It is also exercised under complete control. And it is necessitated by God's perfect divine justice. And as we've seen, it only comes upon those who refuse, they reject, they blaspheme God's mercy. And so in verse 8, the last verse of chapter 15, it says the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. The inability to enter the temple, which is a picture of heaven, God's throne, the inability to enter represents the end of any opportunity to intercede for someone on behalf of sin. That's been done with. No one was able to enter, it says, till the seven plagues of the seven angels was completed. Then I heard a loud voice, John says, from the temple, saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. 
Now, since no one's able to enter the heavenly temple at this point, this loud voice, it speaks of a great, powerful voice coming out of the heavenly temple must represent the voice of God himself. So no messenger or go-between is giving this order for these angels to pour out these bowls of God's wrath. Now, through this whole detailed setup, to this final judgment, we're shown that while it is God who gives the command, these extreme judgments carried out by these angels in reality, they represent, what this is representing is the effects upon the earth and the people that are living on the earth at that time when God's mercy is removed. That's what's taking place. His mercy is removed completely. In the end, he has no other recourse than to give an unrepentant world who wants nothing to do with him. He has no recourse than to give them their desire. Okay, you don't want anything to do with me? See, it's easy to take God's mercy and his gracious provision for granted. I know I have, especially before I got saved. For years, you know, it never entered into my plans to consider whether the sun's going to come up tomorrow or not. It's like saying, honey, if the sun comes up tomorrow, I'll probably be going to work, but, you know, I'm not sure if it's going to or not. So if it doesn't come up, then I might have to make other plans. Or if all our water instantly becomes polluted and this blood's coming out of the shower, blood red water, I might have to go without that today, so, you know, bear with me with that. It sounds like it would make life a little uncomfortable, but that's what takes place here. God just saying I, he, he's going to remove his mercy. So the first went, verse 2, and poured out his bowl upon the earth. And a foul, a loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Now, there's a parallel between these bowl judgments and the previous trumpet judgments that took place in the first half of the tribulation period. The first one is upon the land, the second one's upon the sea, the third one's upon fresh water, and so on. Here, however, in these final judgments, the judgments are even more intensified to, to, to their greatest extreme. The word earth here is speaking of the physical land. And in particular, the plague comes upon those still upon the earth. These sores are going to break out upon their physical bodies. To say that they are foul means that they are evil. Provides, providing an appro appropriate description. The foulness within these people left on the earth will manifest itself outwardly. To say they are loathsome in verse 2, it's a word that means painful or distressing. So not only physically painful, but emotionally painful is going to come upon this. And saying that this type of sore came upon those who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image, that's drawing an equivalence between that, this mark, and these sores. There's a direct correlation, which is going to be evident. They're going to say, why did I take that mark? Because look at what's happening to me. And once again, it's not that God inflicts these sores upon people. God in his mercy has kept them from being afflicted. He doesn't inflict this. God in his mercy does not allow the full extent of disease and sickness to overtake humanity in our current state out of his desire to redeem fallen people. As we saw, you know, a warning had been given previously in chapter 14 by an angelic messenger to the people on earth, don't receive this mark as somehow associated with the worship of the beast. If they did, they were told they would drink the wine of the wrath of God that would be poured out full strength upon the earth. Those who rejected that warning are now experiencing the promised consequences. 
God is merciful. Say, don't do this. Don't, don't go that way. Don't follow that thing. Man, this is what you should be doing. But if someone says, hey, you know, I think I'll do my own thing and follow my own way, then, you know, I have to bear the consequences of that. So verse 3 says, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Now where the second trumpet judgment affected a third of the salt water upon the earth. So in other words, God said only a third. You know, don't let any more than just a third of the ocean. This second bowl judgment destroys all the rest, which would make the world uninhabitable because the oceans are the earth's filtration system to say they became blood as of a dead man is another way of saying it's filled with death and imagine every sea creature dead it's a look it's like blood the life of the flesh is in the blood Leviticus 17 11 says it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul so it's very symbolic of an end having come upon the ability for salvation you can imagine all the sea completely red and just animals and whatever fish just floating on the top and then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is, who was, and who is to be, because you have judged these things. So here all fresh water is gone. And compared to the third trumpet judgment in chapter 8, where a great star fell from heaven like a burning torch, and it fell upon a third of the rivers and the springs of water. This here, it's final. No more fresh water. I mean, imagine that. It's going to be like gold, diamonds. Dude, who cares about any of that stuff? Do you have any water? Water is going to be the most valuable commodity on the earth. When was the last time you thanked God for a fresh glass of water, man? <laughs> but that's what he's supplying for us in his grace right now. You have all the water you need, all you want. Pretty much got to drink out of bottles. You know, it's got to be bottled water now. I remember we were living in Southern California. And there was a drought. You don't realize it at first. You moved to California from Wisconsin, you know. It's all palm trees and lush gardens and lawns and these huge hedges and everything. And then you realize this is all irrigated. I'm living in a desert. And they got rows of palm trees and it's, it's lush. I remember driving down the road at this work truck with these guys I was working with, and you see all these beautiful, you know, manicured lawns, and then you come to one yard, and it's completely brown. And then the next yard is all lush and green again. I said, what happened there? So what, are you from Wisconsin or something? I said, yeah. I said, a person doesn't water their lawn. It, it reverts right back to desert. It's like, you know, Southern California... With all this lushness, it's irrigated mostly from the snowpack that falls in the Sierra Nevada mountains way up north. So they're always measuring that. You, you figure I'm in there measuring how much snow fell up north because that's where our water is going to come from. And you realize you're in a desert. And if that snowpack way up north doesn't build up as it's supposed to, they have to start rationing water down south which is what happened in the late 80s early 90s water was extremely valuable and all of a sudden they had water cops and literally driving around and making sure you're not wasting water you can't just leave your hose running or have, you can't water your lawn you can only do it every other day and it was amazing you realize man this is very valuable stuff you make sure people are conserving this valuable commodity. That's nothing. It's going to come upon the earth at the end. That's why this is just finality. No water. Imagine, you know, the stores at that point. And notice in verse 5, John says, And I heard the angel of the waters. See, apparently there is presently angelic oversight 
placed upon the natural resources of this earth. God says, you know, give them plenty. Nope, only a third, you do that. Back in chapter 7, verse 1, John says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. See, God's creation is not random, nor is it, its regulation random. You know, Jesus said, not one sparrow falls to the earth, but your heavenly Father doesn't know. It's not hyperbole. Hey, that's my sparrow. You know, it just died. He, he has, it's the whole, you know, just regulation of this earth is kept in check, and we're given a small glimpse of that here. There's an angel over the waters. The angel who would know because he presides over the water of the earth he proclaims there in verse 5, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is, who was, and who is to be, because you have judged these things. He is declaring God's righteousness, his rightness, in judging the earth in this way, in judging the waters that he presided over. You are a righteous God. It's a Greek word for that's what the Greek word for righteousness means. It means that which conforms to what is right. Romans chapter 3 says it of human beings, there is none righteous, no, not one. Not one person who conforms to what is right, as far as God is concerned. But Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him, that we could be conformed to what is right according to God's standard of right and wrong. Thank you, Jesus. So we can stand before God and we are conformed through him. And we're being conformed into his image. Here this angel, who is the overseer of the earth's water that has just been trashed, He's declaring how God was right. You're absolutely right in doing this. You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is, who was, and who is to be. That's another way of saying you who are able to view all things from an eternal perspective. You who see the end from the beginning. You're absolutely right in judging these things, verse 5 says, in bringing judgment in this specific way upon these specific elements of the earth in order to judge these remaining inhabitants of the earth. You are right because, it says in verse 6, it's what the conjunction, because they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. To say it is their due is another way of saying that, ju that judgment being poured out is fitting. It's the perfect judgment for them. Not only is God's justice fair, but it is also equal in proportion to the crime committed. The verb there in verse 6 is in an active tense because they shed the blood, literally. Because they, because they shed blood. In other words, that is their intentional purpose while here on earth to shed the blood of anyone who serves God in this world, to eliminate any convicting presence of God's Holy Spirit. That's why they exist here. If someone's going to tell them you need the Lord, they're going to kill them. That's what the world's going to become. You think, oh, come on, can the world become that way? You know, it can very well become that way very quickly. There's hostility growing as we speak, even in our own country. I'll share a prayer request before we break into prayer from uh, somebody who sent this out. And, you know, we're in the crazy times, <laughs> exciting times to be a Christian. But to think, oh, yeah, five years from now we're going to do this, you know, maybe, maybe not. A year from now, maybe, maybe not. A year, bef uh, a year ago, what was the world? Think of that a year ago. You know, it was just getting into March, you know. Did you ever hear of coronavirus? Did you ever hear of COVID-19? You know, you ever hear of church, large churches empty? No, wouldn't even thought of it. Let's get rid of police? Who would have think of that? That's only a year. 
That's a year under uh, positive administration for Christians in Israel. What's a year from now going to bring when there's hostility growing? So here, these, these who killed every convicting presence of God on earth, of human beings who would stand up for God, saints, prophets, it says, due to that, it's only proper, this angel says, that they be given blood to drink, that they be given death to its fullest. It's their due. It's what they earned. It's what they demand for their wages. And I heard another, verse 7, from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. By attributing this to the altar directly, it opens up you know, a very interesting point here. This declaration comes as an amen to the one who just, this angel who just said, You are righteous to do it this way. You know, you may have a little asterisk in verse 7 in your Bible, like mine has, it tells me down at the bottom that the words another from are not in the original Greek in this verse. The added words imply that an angel is saying this, but literally it's just, then I heard the altar say this. It's personifying the altar, which, you know, the altar stood symbolically in the tabernacle or there in front of the temple as a pre-symbol of the coming cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood that was spilt or splashed on the bronze altar and the fire that consumed the sacrifices all symbolized God's judgment of sin and prefigured the propitiation or the satisfying atonement that our Lord gave when he offered the Father, if on our behalf, on the cross for our sins, full redemption for humanity. And so that redeeming altar that prefigured the cross speaks up and says, Amen. You're all, O Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Redemption is over. The cross, a very powerful symbol that the world is growing, I said, increasingly hostile towards. Recently, just very recently, a Christian university in Ohio posted a series of ads on Facebook to promote some of its online theology programs. Facebook rejected one of them because it included a representation of the crucifixion of Christ. They took it off. The monitors at Facebook said the reason for their rejection was that they found the depiction of the cross shocking, sensational, and excessively violent. The university responded with a blog post that surprised Facebook because they agreed with them. They said, you're absolutely right. They wrote, indeed, the crucifixion of Christ was all of those things. It's shocking, sensational, exceedingly violent. They said, you're absolutely right. It was the most sensational action in history. Man executed his God. It was shocking. Yes, God deigned to take on flesh and was obedient unto death, even death on a cross, Philippians 2, verse 8. And it was certainly excessively violent. A man scourged to within an inch of his life, nailed naked to a cross, and left to die. And all the hate of all the sin of the world poured out its wrath upon his humanity. And they went on to write in this blog post that it wasn't the nails that kept Jesus on the cross, it was love for us. He was God. He could have descended from the cross at any moment. No, it was love that kept him there, love for you and me, that we might not be eternally condemned for our sins, but might have eternal life with him and his Father in heaven. That's the power of the cross. And so here, the altar here is prefiguring that. The redemptive symbol is personified as speaking for itself, giving a second witness, which is required when, when a death is going to come upon a human being, whoever is deserving, deserving of death, according to Deuteronomy, shall be put to death only on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so that's what's saying here. The angel said, you are righteous, O Lord, 
the angel of the water declares God's righteousness in judging the very substance needed to sustain life. Why shouldn't those who live only to shed the blood of God's servants be given blood to drink? Why should they be given water? God in his mercy gives that to us. And the altar, symbolizing redemption, says amen. It has been offered through human history. Redemption has been offered all this while up until this point in human history that is yet future. And, and saints and prophets gave their life to proclaim that redemption is available. Redemption that came through the ultimate sacrificial blood shed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Redemption that ended with the blood of the tribulation saints now standing before God, as we saw, all killed by people on the earth. The altar of redemption is the one who seconds the is Amen. Yes, you are righteous, God. You have to bring this judgment, for there's no more redemption. Even so, the altar says, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then it says, the fourth angel sounded. So God has provided escape from these judgments for all who want it in advance. His judgments are true and they are righteous. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and power was given to him to scorch men with fire and men were scorched with great heat. So the fourth trumpet judgment in chapter 8 affected the sun as well. It affected the earth by destroying a third of its light, its light source. You think with all the volcanoes going off right now, multiple volcanoes going off in the world, you get a huge one going on pretty soon, you know, the light source kind of gets dim. But that's what happened in the first half of the tribulation period. Here with this fourth bowl judgment, that same light source is increased in its intensity to where people are scorched. That which once again was given originally for man's comfort and care. Oh, it's a beautiful day. Let's go to the beach. You know, it's awesome, Lord. Thank you for just this perfect weather. It was originally given for comfort with the removal of God's gracious governing, his regulating over that for that purpose. It becomes an instrument of punishment through an overwhelming heat now of a sun. You don't stop to realize that there is a divine thermostat right now that, you know, this huge ball of fire, man, is just the perfect temperature. Oh, God says, you know, fine, have Al, let it just do what it normally does. It increases, it comes down. Presently, there's a limit on it. Wait until it's gone. So you got no water, then you got scorching heat on top of that. And of course, people... At that point, they would cry out for mercy and they'd say, Oh, God, please forgive us. Please spare us. But that's not the case. Instead, it says at the end of verse 9 that they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. In other words, the idea is they know who it is who has the power to allow them to incur this punishment for their sin and yet they blaspheme his name. They express reproach against God, hurling accusations against his honor, against him personally, his name, and refuse to repent, to turn from their sins, and honor God by giving him the glory due his name. That is the one principle of those who reject God. It's one principle of everyone who's going to be in hell, all the way they hold on to the proclamation, I am my own. I run it. I do it. I don't want anyone else. That's going to be the declaration of the world in the face of God's judgments. They'll be blaspheming him. So then we'll pick up at verse 10 next time. As we break into prayer, like I said, I got a prayer request earlier, and I'm sure you've heard of it. If you haven't, they're trying to pass something called the Equality Act. And it's already been through the House of Representatives. It's passed. 
and it's going to the Senate. It needs need a lot of prayer to, you know, for these days just in general. But this Equality Act, these are the things that it's going to, you know, pass. The first thing, it's going to designate schools, churches, and health care organizations as public accommodations. So we would become a public accommodation. With that, schools, churches, and hospitals could be forced to accept the government's beliefs and mandates about sexual orientation and gender identity. It would be very highly intrusive, incredibly far-reaching, and it will threaten everyday speech. In other words, we would have biblical insights, we would have a radio on, even what I'm saying right now would be enough for the government to say, I'm sorry, but, you know, that's against the law. You have to use this pronoun, you have to use this, you know, way of speaking about people. And I guarantee you, we would get a call instantly on a program like that from someone who's saying, hi, I'm whatever, you know, I don't want to get into it. I'm just telling you that is what's going to happen. It would shut down all of our outreach as far as our voice going out of this church. We need a lot of prayer. It would legislate, you know, it would allow boys and girls sports, boys and girls locker rooms, men and women's shelters, men and women's prisons. It will force teachers, students publicly pretend, you know, biological male is a female. Schools will be encouraged or mandated to instruct young children. They're already doing it. They can choose to be a boy or a girl, both, whatever. They use force across... These are just certain aspects of the Equality Act, real equal unless you're you know, not for this. Use the force of law across all 50 states to strip Christian and other religious ministries of the right to hire people of shared faith to pursue a shared mission. And so, you know, you'd, have, you'd be forced to, we've already dealt with this with the radio ministry. We've had to have board meetings because as Hillary Clinton was coming very close to being elected, she was already promoting things like this. And so we got together and it's like, what are we going to do? She's saying she's going to pass these bills and we had to adjust our bylaws and everything in that because it was already being said, if I get elected, these things are going to take place and it would have shut down the whole ministry thank you God it didn't but it would have we would have instantly had to give air time for multiple you know other belief systems because it all have to be equal you can't just have Christianity going on there it's to professionals of the rights of con conscience so doctors medical professionals who long to do no harm, to engage in, you know, transition treatments and hormone blocking, this and that, you know, all these things. You can read it. You go on the Internet. A tool, it would be used by the government to deny or threaten accreditation to religious colleges and universities if they don't satisfy demands of this. That's why, you know, certain schools just say, we don't want your accreditation because at that point you have to accept secular input from it. But please pray for this as we uh, break in after a song right now so that we as a body can be praying to the Lord to, to just you know protect our nation. God, we thank you that we have the freedoms we have, God, that we can meet here on a Friday night, Lord, still freely and worship you, Lord, and, and open your word and just proclaim what it says, not even... It, Lord, add any input, but just it, let it speak for itself. Break it down and let it go and let it go forth. I thank you for the night my wife and I heard a radio program as a complete heathens, unbelievers, and heard the gospel over the radio for the first time, and we bowed our heads, and when we finished praying, we were born again, and we're brand new people, God, just through a radio bro broadcast listening in our kitchen. You saved us, God. You took away drug abuse. You took away alcoholism. You took even those stinking cigarettes away. Thank you, God. You are so good. I wish you'd just take this pride and every other thing away now, too, God. And all the junk that's still in my heart. All the external stuff was easy, it seems like. All that garbage still in my heart, God. 
I can't wait for the day when this flesh is thrown in the, in the dirt, Lord. I'm rid of it. Good riddance. Serve you and you alone, God, till that day continue to hold us up, Lord. I pray we can retain our freedoms to meet, to, to just share the gospel freely, God. We look to you, Lord. You've always been faithful. You are faithful. You will be faithful, Lord, no matter what. Lord, your word is not chained. Your word is not going to fall short, God. You, you hold the very breath in these people's lungs. Lord, they have no power but what you give to them, as we, as, as such as we. That's why we worship you, Lord. We praise you and we thank you, God. And ask, God, that our time of prayer right now, Lord, would be fervent. It would be effectual, God, and it would avail much. It would be pleasing, God, and ascending to your throne like sweet incense at the hour of prayer. We love you, Lord. We praise you. And, Lord, this, this is the high point of the evening. All unto your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.